Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and today I wanted to talk about the disparity between the female neurotypical brain and the autistic male brain. So if you are a neurotypical partner in a relationship with a man on the autism spectrum and you find yourselves in frequent disagreements and fights and misunderstandings, it shouldn't be too terribly surprising because the two of you are wired almost 180 degree opposite. We'll look at five points to illustrate this. Point number one, neurotypical women tend to be more talkative and utilize nonverbal cues very quickly and easily, whereas men on the autism spectrum tend to be less talkative and they don't pick up on nonverbal cues. Point number two, Neurotypical women tend to want to work through relationship problems, whereas men on the autism spectrum tend to want to avoid discussing relationship problems when possible because it raises their anxiety such that they have a hard time listening and understanding and retaining and following through. Instead, they may do some version of a meltdown or a shutdown. Issue number three. Neurotypical women tend to intuit emotions and emotional cues very quickly and easily, whereas men on the autism spectrum tend to be alexithymic. In other words, they have great difficulty understanding emotions in themselves and others. Point number four, neurotypical women tend to focus on how to create a solution that works for the couple, whereas men on the autism spectrum tend to be more isolated and independent and would rather find a solution on their own. And point number five, neurotypical women tend to approach times of stress by forming strong group bonds, especially with their significant other, in this case, their autistic husband. Whereas men on the autism spectrum tend to have a fight or flight response to stressful situations, and they deal with stress either through avoidance or an expression of anger. So given these differences, it's easy to understand why neurodiverse relationships take so many odd twists and turns. So neurodiverse partners would do well to extend just a bit of grace and mercy to one another, knowing that each is wired so differently that conflict and misunderstanding is inevitable. ASD level one, developmental disorder. That means that developmentally, the social emotional part of the brain is underdeveloped relative to the logical part of the brain. That's not an insult. Uh, there's way more strengths with ASD level one than weaknesses. Guys in here are probably smarter than me. Uh, they're great at uh, systematizing, great with logic, great with uh, seeing things in pictures, great at looking at a variety of chaotic uh, symbols and being able to make sense out of it so the the list is long and deep of the assets so there is a bonus ironically that comes with AST level one Bill Gates created the computer as an example so we need we're, we the society benefits from having this different way of thinking since they're low in social and emotional intelligence compared to the other things that are going on where they're high they are by default low in social and emotional needs. There's the problem. If, if I suck at riding a unicycle, and it doesn't matter how many times I practice it, I still can't get it, I'm by default not going to have any need to ride a unicycle. So the NTYs in here, opposite. High in social and emotional intelligence and needs. Next problem, since we're talking about social and emotional stuff, his deficits, if we want to call it that, appear as if he is selfish, insensitive, uncaring, narcissistic. Emphasis on appears that way. She makes the false assumption that that's what's going on, and why wouldn't she? Next problem, she tries to recruit him to be more socially and emotionally connected, raises his anxiety. The method that she uses, I'm not faulting her, she's doing the best that she knew how, given the circumstances, raises his anxiety. What does he do? He seeks anxiety reduction. How does that look? He spends a lot of time with his special interest or his work or he isolates. What is, what is the end result of that? It downloads the, it to the NT mind as just more selfishness, uncaring, insensitivity, and doesn't care about the relationship. I'm not important. So there's the dilemma. Oh, and we could throw in coronavirus, political tension, racial unrest, quarantine with the person that you're not getting along with, and maybe four or five other things. And then you wonder why there's a problem? 
that's the bad news. The good news is um, social skills can be taught. He can learn to develop some emotional literacy. It's not doomsday. The, for the NTYs, you would love for him to be up here, right level with you in the business of emotional reciprocity. That's never going to happen. But we can sure get him from down here to somewhere in the middle ground, which could conceivably get you in the area where it's at least acceptable now. Perhaps not ideal, but it's a noble effort that is resulting in some significant improvement. So the question then becomes, okay, well, what, are we, what can we do? Well, the first thing we just did is we established the fact that a lot of this behavior is not intentional, but I'm also going to validate that that doesn't really matter on one hand because unintentional hurtful behavior still hurts. So that doesn't get him off the hook. Having these traits is no license to just go around spraying on people like a skunk because you have to be high anxiety in the moment. So he can work on, he can work around his areas of challenge and he can certainly capitalize on his strengths, which there are many. And she, and when he has his blind spots, she can be some version of a compassionate coach that wouldn't take much time or energy to pull that off. Okay, and this next question is, my husband has many, if not most, of the traits of Asperger's syndrome, but he refuses to talk about it or go for a diagnosis. Instead, he says, I'm just blaming him for our marriage problems. I'm about to the end of my rope. Any suggestions? Well, um, if your Asperger's husband's symptoms are threatening your marriage and he chooses to protect those symptoms rather than manage those symptoms, then his priorities may not be conducive to a long-term relationship, quite honestly. And I know that's hard to hear. And notice I do say manage the symptoms rather than trying to fix them or control them. It's about managing symptoms, which is very, very possible. So if his priorities remain the same, you, in this case being the neurotypical wife, need to decide whether or not this is the right relationship for you. Even if he does decide to get a diagnosis and does accept that as a fact, you still need a strategy to resolve disagreements. I have received probably hundreds of emails from neurotypical wives who say that their husbands are simply in denial. But the bottom line is this, your husband has to make a choice about what he values most, his marriage or refusing to seek a diagnosis. There's the million dollar question right there. What does he value most, his marriage or refusing to seek a diagnosis? If he values his relationship with you more than staying in refusal mode, then he'll go and see if he has the disorder. If he values staying in refusal mode more than his marriage, then quite honestly, you'll need to do some serious soul searching to decide whether you're going to stay in this relationship or not. But on a more positive note, there's a certain way that you can go about this that may make him a little more inclined to seek a diagnosis. If your husband has Asperger's but he doesn't know it, it's going to affect him anyway. And if he does know, he can minimize the negative impact while at the same time leverage the positive. And there's many more positives associated with the disorder than negatives. So without the knowledge that he has Asperger's, he may fill in, fill in that void with other more damaging explanations of his behavior. For example, he might say, I'm a failure, I'm weird, I'm a disappointment, I'm not living up to my potential, I'm no good at this marriage thing, uh, I'm a failure, and so on. So he's probably filled in uh, the blank, him not knowing whether or not he has the disorder, with some very negative self-talk. So as you try to talk with your husband about this, you'll want to be sure to discuss his strengths rather than focusing on the weaknesses or the challenges or the deficits that you have witnessed. And all adults with Asperger's have significant areas of strength. 
In fact, I'll go one better than that. They have more strengths than deficits. And that's what you need to focus on as you're trying to get him hooked into the idea of going and seeking a diagnosis. So if you'll include a lot of positive things you see in him that may also be related to Asperger's, he's not going to feel attacked by you or blamed by you. And this may make him a, a bit more open to the possibility of facing his fears by going for a diagnosis. And that's what you're running into here with him uh, being in denial is he's, a, he's afraid of what he may find out. So in working with adults on the autism spectrum, sometimes we get into this business of attribution retraining. And that's a fancy term for basically helping individuals who have mind blindness, alexithymia, and other uh, traits of the disorder, such as executive function deficits and so on, helps these individuals to check the evidence before reacting. <clears throat> because if you are a spouse of someone on the autism spectrum, uh, you may have been in a situation where you've said something that in your mind was totally 100% neutral and harmless, but it downloaded in his mind as criticism or that you're being controlling or something along those lines. So one common effect of misinterpretation for people on the autism spectrum is the development of distrust in others and honestly, in some cases, it's even what I would refer to as a mild form of paranoia. And this is largely due to impaired theory of mind skills in the cognitive profile of these individuals on the autism spectrum. Now, a theory of mind is the ability that we all have in order to make sense of the world we live in. Every person's thoughts, knowledge, beliefs, desires, and so on, make up his or her own unique theory of mind. Now, people on the autism spectrum have difficulty conceptualizing and appreciating the thoughts and feelings of others. And this is called mind blindness. And it's this mind blindness thing that makes it difficult for these individuals to be able to relate to and understand the behaviors of you the NT spouse, and others as well, co-workers, other family members, and so on. By failing to account for others' perspectives, individuals on the autism spectrum tend to misinterpret their messages. And for the NT spouses listening to this video, you've lived it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Mind blindness also means that the individual with ASD level one has difficulty in distinguishing whether someone's actions are intentional or accidental, okay? So neurotypical people will know from the context, body language, facial cues, uh, and character of the other person involved that the intent was not to cause distress, injury, criticism, but people on the autism spectrum often focus primarily on the act and the consequences. For example, uh, he bumped into me and it hurt and so it was intentional. Whereas neurotypical people would consider the circumstances. For example, he was running, he tripped, he accidentally fell into me. So the, the neurotypical is able to fill in the blank with something that makes a little more sense than uh, conclusion jumping. With individuals on the high end of autism, there may need to be training in this business of checking the evidence before overreacting to the event or the person in question. And this training is called attribution training. The mind-blind individual often blames others exclusively and tends not to consider his own contribution. Or he can excessively blame himself for the events. So he, it could be attributed on either extreme. Now, one aspect of ASD is a tendency for some of these individuals to adopt an attitude of arrogance where the perceived focus of control is always external. So when the ASD individual believes that he was a victim of some form of injustice, the perpetrator, in this case would be the NT spouse, may be held responsible and become the target for punishment. 
or chastisement or a long lecture or be on the receiving end of a shutdown or meltdown. So people on the autism spectrum have considerable difficulty accepting that they themselves have contributed to an event. But again, the opposite can occur where he has extremely low self-esteem and feels personally responsible for too many things, which results in feelings of anxiety and guilt. So in other words, he's either taking on too much responsibility for the issue or he's deflecting and, and not taking any responsibility for the issue in question. So attribution training involves establishing the reality of the situation, the various participants' contributions to an incident, and determining how the individual on the autism spectrum can change his or her perception and response. A part of social skills training for this individual will revolve around how he attributes his success and will likely require some attribution retraining to take place. So this is where the therapist, for example, retrains the individual to think about his success as something he actively influences, not something of which he is a victim. Now there are four main factors to which we can attribute success or failure, and those are effort, ability, luck, and task difficulty. So we'll look at each of these in turn. Uh, a person attributing effort may say something along the lines of, um, I worked hard and that's why I did so good, or I was lazy and that's why I didn't accomplish my goal. So here I am attributing effort to the outcome. A person attributing ability may say something along the lines of, uh, uh, I'm so stupid, that's why I failed, or I'm so intelligent and that's why I succeeded. So here I would be attributing uh, the outcome to my ability. A person attributing luck may say something along the lines of, uh, I was wearing my lucky shirt today and so that's why I won the game or I wasn't wearing my lucky shirt today and that's why I lost the game. So here I'm attributing luck to the outcome. And lastly, there's task difficulty. So if I'm attributing task difficulty, I might say something along the lines of um, uh, the, the test was so easy, that's why I passed. Or the test was really super hard and that's why I failed. So there I'm attributing task difficulty to the outcome. You know, people don't have any control over luck or task difficulty and ability is gained through gaining knowledge and skills. So therefore, the only aspect that people can directly influence on a regular basis is their effort. And this is where attribution training takes place. So the individual on the autism spectrum who adopts an effort-based belief gains an internal locus of control, which means he believes he is in control of circumstances, and he subsequently feels empowered. Now this is where the individual comes to believe that he has enough ability that with effort he can be successful. And that is uh, attribution training. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with adultaspergerschat.com and today I got a brief message for the NT wives out there who are in a relationship with a husband on the autism spectrum. Although it would, what I'm about to say would apply if the inverse were the case as well. In other words, uh, he is the NT and she is the one with autism spectrum disorder. But uh, you may have run into a situation, and I'm sure you have, where you've tried to have a conversation with him about some of the relationship issues you'd like to resolve. And the thing just ended badly and always does. And uh, you just get to the point where you just give up even trying to have conversations about difficult topics. So what goes on, and this is kind of hidden, um, and, and honestly, this conversation is going to be a bit spooky because it, we're talking about stuff that's almost at a spiritual level. But anyway, you, by virtue of feeling emotionally deprived and uh, not getting the emotional reciprocity that you want and honestly deserve, are in a state of anger, frustration, perhaps depression, anxiety, and so on. And uh, why wouldn't you be? But when you go into a situation where now you're going to have to have a conversation with him, 
you you come into that conversation negatively charged. And what I mean by that is you're giving off a, a negative vibration that he will pick up on. And he won't even know he's picking up on it. He'll just know that now his anxiety and anger is up because now he has matched your vibration. And so we call this a vibrational match. In this case, it's a negative one. So now he is uh, charged with uh, an element of negativity. His anger, resentment, and so on now begins to rise, which now his, his negative energy field comes to you, which fe feeds your existing negativity, which then goes back to him. And so now you're in this negative feedback loop. So you're giving off a negative charge. He picks up on the negative charge, then becomes also a sender of more negative energy, which you pick up on. And we call this again, a vibrational match. So I know this whole conversation is a little mysterious. It's something that you can't see, but you know, there are things that exist, even though you can't see it, uh, you're breathing right now. You don't actually see the air, for example. But you've already experienced this. Maybe you weren't conscious of it. Have you ever been around somebody and you just felt uneasy around that person? They weren't doing anything wrong. They weren't giving off any obvious facial cues or body language. They may not have even been talking. They were just within your field and you just felt uneasy around them and you didn't even know why. So we know that this business of giving, of, of having an energy field that extends a few feet beyond your actual physical body, we know that that exists. So this happens, but it happens more profoundly when the, the feelings in this case are more intense. And, uh, you know, there's a wide range of emotions and each emotion has, its, has different levels of intensity. Sadness is a low vibration. Panic is kind of a high vibration. They give off different levels of uh, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, cortisone, all of these fight or flight chemicals that get you either ready to run or to fight or to hide. Or in this case, we're talking about you get you geared up to argue and fight and defend yourself and try to get the other person to, to cooperate and so on. All of that business is energy by definition. And you give off this energy. And that person that you're arguing with picks up on this energy. And that's why they argue right back. And that's why you get nowhere. All you've done is exchanged a bunch of negative energy. And now both parties are more resentful, more angry, and exhausted, and more willing to just give up because we never get anywhere with these conversations. So this begs the question, well, what can I do in that situation? Well, a good first step would be to be aware of what's going on behind the scenes. If you peel back the curtains, you will see that anger and anxiety is just waiting to leap out in energy form. And so when you try to have a conversation the next time with your husband, and by the way, this works both ways. The ASD husband needs to use this information when he has a gripe with his NT wife as well. Go into that conversation with a different mindset such that you are aware that you could get charged with negative energy. In other words, getting the chemicals going in you that stimulate anxiety and anger and frustration and um, you're, you're wanting things to be fair. You're wanting people to behave. You want to uh, get people to do what you think they should be doing. All of that type of self-talk is getting your body charged up with negative energy. So the best thing you could do, and it would be a good first step, is to when you go into this next conversation that may happen later today, ask yourself this question, how can I go into this conversation and have the mindset where I'm going to be positively charged. I'm going to come into this conversation with as much love, compassion, and gratitude as I can muster. I'm going to visualize how this person was back in the day when I actually enjoyed him and actually loved him and actually loved to be around him. I'm going to visualize that so that even though I may not necessarily feel that way today, that's going to be what I'm going to visualize so that when I come into this conversation, I'm actually giving off 
positive vibes. And then he's going to pick up on some of that positivity. He's going to match you vibrationally. You get some of that positivity back. Now you're in a positive feedback loop. Links below this video for more information. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, this is Mark Hutton with adultaspergerschat.com. And uh, one of the things that I run into a lot with couples where one is affected by Asperger's syndrome and the other partner or spouse is a neurotypical is the, the neurotypical spouse understands that her Asperger's husband, for example, um, is hardwired in a certain way and that he does have a developmental disorder. And but then she's wondering, okay, well, given that he has these uh, challenges or deficits, how are we ever going to communicate? How is he ever going to understand how I feel or meet my emotional needs? Well, your first line of defense is obviously to go get counseling from a marriage and family therapist who has experience with autism spectrum disorders. I run into so many situations where they have sought counseling from a neurotypical therapist who offers neurotypical advice, which is going to result in, you know, one of the parties since they're not wired neurotypically, one of the parties are totally not going to understand, you know, how to follow through with this plan because it's not in alignment with how they think. So the first thing to do is, is get with somebody who knows what they're talking about with respect to being sensitive to the partner with Asperger's syndrome, specifically the mind blindness issues, alexithymia, sensory sensitivities, executive function deficits, and so on. It would be a whole lot easier and a lot less painful to just go beat your head against a brick wall than to seek neurotypical advice from a neurotypical th therapist and start employing neurotypical strategies in your marriage. If you've tried it, you know it doesn't work, okay? So there's so many things that can be done. I just want to mention two in this video here. One of the first lines of defense is when you are going to have a heavy-handed conversation with your Asperger's husband you want to give him a heads up that there is going to be a conversation that might be a little stressful. So you don't, you don't hit him with a surprise because people with Asperger's, they don't like change and they don't like surprises. The next thing you want to do when the both of you, when you come into this heavy handed conversation that has the potential for stress and anxiety that can result in a fight, you want to view yourselves as team players more specifically, you want to come into this conversation that, that has p the potential for uh, a meltdown or a shutdown or however it ends badly. You want to come into that conversation with a mindset of we're going to pretend as if we're business partners. You know, you are a team player. If you were on a professional football team, you wouldn't treat one of your team players the way you do your spouse. If you were a uh, the co-owner of a, of a business, you wouldn't treat your business partner the same way you treat your, your spouse. So you want to view any heavy-handed conversations, especially when it has something to do with finances or the kids, you want to come in with the mindset that we're dealing with this like it's a business and your family is a business in a sense. The other thing that I want to mention in this short video is when you do have to have this heavy-handed conversation, that has the potential for disaster. I find it very helpful to have a brisk walk while you're having the conversation because I have found that when people are having a stressful conversation, their, their breathing becomes very shallow and in some cases they stop breathing altogether, which just reinforces the brain's perception that there's really a threat at hand. So when you have a brisk walk, you're forced to breathe while you're talking. And there's something about breath work while you're having discussion that tends to keep things a little more on the even keel. You can think of it like this. You can't talk and, and take a drink of water at the same time. They're incompatible. And similarly, it's hard to have a really knock down, drag out fight when you're, when you're breathing fairly heavy. So something about oxygenating, oxygenating the brain does help bring the anxiety down to a more tolerable level where you still have a semblance of a rational brain as you're trying to discuss a particular problem and come up with a, a solution. So there's multiple things that can be done in a situation where your partner is limited, so to speak. 
when he has alexithymia issues, mind blindness, executive function problems, sensory sensitivities, and three or four other things that, that we could talk about that make it a real challenge for him to keep a rational head when discussing stressful topics. But the, the two main things that I want you to take away from this video are view one another as business partners. And also when you're having this uh, rather stressful conversation, do it while you have a brisk walk, okay? There's no reason why you can't. Even in the winter time, you put on your coats, walk around the block or whatever and have that conversation there. So there's, there's numerous other ways to actually get a connection between the two of you that, that yields a desirable result. I'm just mentioning these two. If you click on the link below, uh, we can discuss multiple ways to where you can have a good connection with your Asperger's partner such that troubleshooting doesn't end in knockdown, drag out, meltdown, shutdowns, rage, and fights. Okay? Thanks, guys. Hey guys, this is Mark Hutton with AdultAspergersChat.com and in this brief video I want to look at one of the reasons why your partner with Asperger's Syndrome or high functioning autism is less able to cope with unexpected change. If you've been in a relationship with someone with Asperger's Syndrome and you have uh, had to have some conversations with them that are somewhat stressful, perhaps, you know, something to do with finances or moving or the children or whatever, or you have decided to make some significant changes to one degree or another, you may have noticed that your Asperger's partner gets extremely agitated and annoyed and has heightened anxiety. Well, according to researchers, cortisol which is the body's stress hormone, may be a key factor in understanding both Asperger's and high-functioning autism. Cortisol is one of the several stress hormones that acts similar to a red alert that is triggered by stressful circumstances, which helps the individual react quickly to changes. In neurotypical people, there's a two-fold increase in levels of cortisol within 30 minutes of waking up, with levels gradually declining during the day as part of the internal body clock. However, research suggests that people with Asperger's and high-functioning autism don't have this peak. This difference in stress hormone levels may be highly significant in explaining why people on the autism spectrum are less able to react and cope with unexpected change. Studies reveal that these individuals may not adjust normally to the challenge of a new environment on waking, which may affect the way they subsequently engage with the world around them. So by viewing the symptoms of Asperger's and high-functioning autism as a stress response rather than a behavior problem can help partners or spouses of people on the autism spectrum develop a plan for minimizing or even avoiding circumstances that may cause anxiety in the person with the disorder. Hey guys, this is Mark with AdultAspergersChat.com and today I want to talk to the NT wives or husbands as the case may be, uh, when you go on too long with your message delivery or when you try to tackle more than one issue at a time, your ASD spouse is going to run into brain overload. We're just going to call it data overload because you're providing too much data too quickly. He's not able to absorb all of that. And so at some point in your message delivery, let's say, for example, it's a 20 minute discussion, or in this case, perhaps a monologue, he's going to get to the point where he's not gonna be able to listen or understand or retain. So think of your ASD spouse as that old computer that you used to have that has so much software on it and so little memory space that when you turn it on and you work on it for a little while, it slows down, slows down, and at some point it freezes, and then you have to shut it down and reboot it and then it takes forever to start up again but then when it does it kind of runs a little faster than it did previously so your husband on the autism spectrum is like that slow computer and the more data dumping you do the more data overload he runs into and then the rest is history because at some point he can't even listen to you anymore because all he can focus on is his anxiety or how he's feeling criticized. Um, and if you continue to data dump, he's only going to be able to listen to 80% of your message. And as you continue to data dump, he's only gonna be able to understand 60% of what he listens to. And as you continue to data dump, 
he's only going to be able to retain 40 percent of what he understands and as you continue to data dump he's only going to implement about 10 percent of what he retained so of your 100 percent message delivery you're only getting about a 10 percent return on your investment of time and energy i hope that makes sense so here are some examples of data dumping when you talk too long when you tackle more than one issue at a time when you come at him when you're emotional or upset either angry or crying when you come at him with poor timing in other words he's not prepared he didn't know that you were going to have the talk he's doing something else so you're you're coming at him at a very inappropriate time for him because it disrupts his routine or structure the other component of data dumping would be when you speak in vague terms especially when you talk about how you feel and expect him to take how you feel and apply it to some course of action he's supposed to take okay feelings especially if you have alexithymia are vague so your expression of feelings is not his motivation to change and lastly another data dumping component would be jumping from the current issue to multiple past issues that he can't fix now so there it is your data dumping downloads as data overload that he is going to do some version of a meltdown or a shutdown literally he's going to have to shut down and reboot Hey guys, this is Mark with adultaspergerschat.com and today I got a message for spouses and partners on the autism spectrum. If you are so self-absorbed, to use a sarcastic term, in your special interest or your work, then your NT spouse feels like she's just getting crumbs from you. In other words, so little quality and quantity time that it's just next to nothing. In fact, I hear from NT wives all the time. They even use the term crumbs. And uh, they get to the point where they're so emotionally deprived that they would actually settle for some crumbs. Some of them aren't even getting crumbs. So we have 168 hours in a week, right? So if you're only spending two hours of quality time with your NT spouse, that's only 1.19%. You know, if you had a bag of potato chips and your wife came up to you wanting some potato chips, you wouldn't just hand her one potato chip and say, there you go, and then you leave and go into the other room and leave her there with her one potato chip. That's just enough to whet her appetite for more. So when you come along once in a blue moon and give her a five second one arm hug, it's just enough to tease her, but not enough to satisfy her. So NT spouses are often left wanting more more quality time, more quantity time. They feel like they're on the back burner, that on the ASD spouse's list of priorities, she's at the bottom. So the moral to this story is, don't be so stingy with your time. It doesn't take much effort on your part, virtually no money. She wants to spend time with you. She wants you to be present. Put your digital devices down, shut your computer off, perhaps even turn the TV off and just be with her. Sitting there in the same room with her on the other end of the couch while you're looking at your iPhone is not quality time. She wants give and take in conversation. She wants to share what's going on in her life. She wants to get a little bit of moral support, physical affection, and emotional reciprocity from you. That is quality time. That is sharing half of the bag of the potato chips with her. Okay, what if I said you are neurotic and a monomaniac? What I mean is uh, neuroticism is basically being under a state of anxiety for so many years that it has become a personality trait. And monomania, what I mean by that term, is simply spending a lot of time on one activity to the exclusion of most others. So why would you be neurotic and monomaniacal? In a nutshell, you are someone on the autism spectrum who has tried to figure out the neurotypical world. And at some level, that has been extremely difficult, in some cases impossible. What does that result in? A lot of anxiety 
And if you have this anxiety over a number of years or decades, it becomes a personality trait. So now we're talking neuroticism. So what does a neurotic do? They try to alleviate their anxiety, in this case by engaging in a special interest for lengthy periods of time because it's relaxing, but unfortunately it causes problems because as a child your parents are pissed because you're spending all your time with your special interest instead of doing homework and with your spouse she's pissed because you're spending all your time doing your special interest instead of spending time with her so your special interest calms you down takes the anxiety away for the moment but increases your anxiety in the long term because now people are upset with you because you've disengaged from the neurotypical world and why wouldn't you since this world doesn't fit at some level think of it like this what if you were able to travel to planet autism and everybody up there had an autism spectrum disorder and we're talking about ASD level one or high functioning autism, Asperger's syndrome, whatever you want to call it. Everybody's the same though. So now you don't have to try to figure out the neurotypicals because they ain't got no neurotypicals up there. So you're up there on planet autism. There's no anxiety now because everybody's the same. So therefore you haven't turned into a neurotic because you have, in other words, you haven't had a long standing anxiety over decades and now all, your anxiety has turned into a personality trait called neuroticism. So that doesn't exist. And now there's no need to be a monomaniac, in other words, engage in one special activity all the time to the exclusion of most others because there's no anxiety to run from. Yeah, in this little fantasy world here and on planet autism, it's possible that everybody is engaging in their special activity, but it doesn't matter because that is the norm. That's what everybody is doing. You don't get chastised for doing that because that is the normal thing to do. So now the question becomes, is high-functioning autism truly a disorder? Well, in a neurotypical world, Yes, it is a disorder. In other words, it's a bad order. Translation, it's an unpopular way to connect with people that are neurotypicals. But on planet autism, where there are no neurotypicals, the autistic brain is now typical. So in this way, there would be no disorder. Instead, it would be order. So what I run into a lot is the situation where the man, in this case, we'll use the ASD man and the NT wife as the example, he is literally afraid of his NT wife at this point when the conflict has gone on for years unresolved. And uh, this usually starts out by she, the NT wife, has not experienced the degree of emotional reciprocity that she wants and needs and desires. A lot of her expectations are not being met. This goes on for quite a few years with uh, good intention. She tries to reconcile differences, trying to make the relationship work, trying to fix some broken pieces and her good faith effort usually downloads in his mind, the ASD man, as complaining, criticism, being parental, constantly correcting him. And so now he feels like he's on thin ice all the time, like he's in the doghouse much of the week. And I have heard so many self-reports from these men that they honestly are afraid to say much or do much because they just assume that they're going to get in trouble. And so they tend to basically go into shy mode. And uh, this could look like uh, he's spending less time with you. He doesn't really want to engage conversation with you. He may view you as his major source of anxiety. He tends to be preoccupied with other things. And that downloads in the NT wife's mind as he doesn't care about the relationship. I'm not important to him and so on. But in many cases, what's really going on, he is just trying to avoid drama and conflict and arguments. He doesn't feel like he he can win 
And at some level, he's given up hope because he's, in his mind anyway, he has tried numerous things, none of which seem to help anything. And these men will say this a lot. It doesn't matter what I say or do, it's never good enough. And they are literally afraid, and I'm not exaggerating, they are con constantly overly concerned for good reason in their mind that it's better to say nothing at this point because when I try to fix it, oftentimes it makes a bad problem worse. And um, they're basically in a form of flight. And you may notice as an NT wife that sometimes he flips to the other side of that spectrum and goes into fight which would be the meltdown, adult temper tantrum, and so on, and then flips back to the shutdown. So the moral to the story then is we need to come up with a communication strategy such that the NT wife can get her point across. In this case, the point being I need to get some of my needs met without that downloading in his brain as I'm being attacked yet again. And so I really need to protect myself and how I protect myself is to disconnect. Does your neurotypical partner suspect that you have an autism spectrum disorder? And do you feel that she blames you for most of the relationship problems due to this disorder? Well, if that is the case, then here is kind of an informal quiz to see if you might want to pursue a formal diagnosis. If you answer yes to most of these questions, then your spouse may be right. So. Here we go. You either have the following traits or you have been accused of having them. Ready? Conflict resolution seems impossible. According to her, I am very insensitive, uncaring, and selfish. Anxiety is a common state for me to be in. Being in this relationship seems very difficult and complicated. Even if we are physically together, there is an emotional distance that leaves my wife feeling alone. Even though I like having a companion, it does create stress for me. Her expectations keep changing. Her feelings are all over the map and change from minute to minute. I am easily stressed by some social situations. I am mostly interested in my special activity rather than spending quality time with my wife. I can be self-absorbed. I can get defensive easily. I demonstrate my feelings of love through my actions rather than words or physical affection. I don't exactly know what she expects of me. I don't fully understand the nature of give and take in conversations. I don't like making commitments to other people. I don't like pressure or expectations put on me. I feel anxious when unpredictable situations occur or when things change. I find it difficult to empathize. I find it impossible to sense what my wife is feeling. I have difficulty talking about my emotions. I have had a hard time holding on to a job. I have trouble making the connection between what she is feeling and what I have done or not done to hurt her. I like talking about my special interests a lot. I need long periods of solitude and quiet time. I need structure and routine. I often cut her off and change the subject when she is in mid-sentence. I often deny there is a problem with our relationship. I often fail to follow through with what I have agreed to do. I often worry that I'm not capable of being a good husband. I did put some effort into winning her in the early going of the relationship, but now I don't put much effort in keeping her. I sometimes suffer from sensory overload. I tend to stay in my rational mind most of the time. I usually don't like to socialize. I usually have trouble talking with my wife about emotional issues. I'm more comfortable with old friends than new ones. 
I've had significant relationship problems long before I met my wife. Making compromises is difficult for me. My best efforts in the relationship still don't please her. My wife believes that she has made more adjustments to me over the years than I have to her. My wife claims she is depressed and emotionally damaged due to our relationship. My wife complains that she feels like she has to mother me. Our relationship was passionate in the beginning, but the passion has dwindled over the years down to virtually nothing. Our sex life has stalled. She always tries to change me. She claims that I'm lazy and don't contribute enough, for example, with chores. She has said I am narcissistic. She is a very complicated and difficult person. She's usually disappointed whenever her birthday or anniversary occurs. She is very needy and clingy. She often says she's not important to me. Sometimes even neutral conversations with my wife can seem like an attack or criticism. This relationship is often messy. When she wants to talk about our problems, I immediately get worried that it's going to turn into another fight. And when we argue, I tend to view my wife as very illogical, overly emotional, and even neurotic. So if you answered yes to most of those, then you don't necessarily know if you have the disorder, but you certainly know you have enough of the traits to cause relationship difficulties. And on that note, there's a link below this video if you want to get a hold of me for group or individual counseling. I also have an ebook available. Thanks, guys. Thank you.